The Jerry Pal Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, preparing society and meeting the needs of an aging population. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, after a long summer break, we're getting back to the thick of things. We have two guests with us. Both of them are recurring. Both of them are recurring. Ann Kelly was back with us. She's a recurring co-host and healthcare social worker. Welcome back. Thanks. You, nice to see you. And the Jerry Powell introer. So that's the voice that you hear at the beginning of every Jerry Powell podcast, Ann Kelly's voice. That's Ann Kelly. And we have Sean Morrison, who is a repeat guest to this podcast, who is the chair of the uh, Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Care at Mount Sinai and also the director of the National Palliative Care Research Center. Did I get all that right, Sean? You got all that right, Alex. It's good to see you guys again. Good to see you. Welcome and back. Sean, we're going to be talking about a recent JPM article, Journal of Palliative Medicine article titled Advanced Directives slash Care Planning, Clear, Simple, and Wrong. A lot of wrong. controversy there. Wrong. Done, done, done. But before we do, we asked for a song request. Do you have a song request for Alex? I do have a song request for Alex. Alex, I would love to hear the Who's Won't Get Fooled Again. I love this song. Uh, so I was not, um, wasn't a fan of the Who growing up, but I had so much fun listening to this song on YouTube, listening to Pete Sa- Townsend play it um, in his 60s, and it's, it's age 70 on YouTube. There's a re- recording of him playing acoustically. Um, I shared it with my son, who's a budding uh, guitarist, and... Um, Wow, I have to say, I think Pete Townsend has the best right hand in uh, all of uh, rock history, maybe. So thank you for choosing this. I do not have the best right hand, but we'll see what happens. (laughs) We'll be fighting in the streets With our children at our feet And the morals that they worship will be gone Take a bow for the new revolution Smile and grin at the change all around Pick up my guitar and play Just like yesterday Get on my knees and pray We won't be fooled again Well, there's my hack version. Oh, it was brilliant, Alex. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. You like I'll how I had to scroll the screen to see the next lyrics partway through? <laughs> you know, we usually ask the uh, the person doing the request, why did you pick the song? But uh, we won't get fooled again is a, is a pretty good indication of <laughs> the topic at hand. And I'm going to just start off with, with a quote from your JPM article. Um, the history of advanced directives, advanced care planning reminds me of my family's 1975 Ford Pinto, a car with a fundamentally flawed design, yet whose every broken part we dutifully repaired for five years until it was finally and mercifully sold for parts. Why do we keep waiting for advanced directives, advanced care planning to work? Wow. First of all, you had a Four Pinto, um, and you didn't blow up in it like that. That's that's so. And yeah, the gas tank didn't blow up, but um, it just died eventually. But yes, we did have a Ford Pinto. Embarrassingly enough. Okay, so let's let's talk about advanced directives and advanced care planning. You know, I see a lot of lumpers and splitters. Are are we going to combine both advanced directive and advanced care planning into like this stuff just doesn't work, or are you focused Um, one on one or the other? I avoid the critiques that I get that they're not the same thing and one has evolved from the other and we're not going to talk about advanced directives. Um, Why don't we talk about one and then the other? And I think this comes back to that analogy that you read, Eric, which um, when you read it sounds a lot more harsh than um, when I wrote it on the page. (laughs) But, you know, if we go back, and I've got enough gray hair that I can go back this far, Um, But if we go back until the 70s, and we really start thinking about 
what was a major problem in healthcare. And one was that people were receiving treatments at the end of life when they couldn't make decisions for themselves that appeared not to be consistent with their wishes. And there was this great idea that, well, if we just write down what would we would want when we can't make decisions, that would prevent the problem. And the living will or the advanced directive was born. And the problem was that it's really hard to predict the future. Um, even if you can, you may not be the same person in that future. And it's really impossible to outline every, as you guys know, every scenario that you might want. And even if you can, I mean, this page takes me back 25 years, you know, advanced directives get lost, they get misplaced, they don't get in the medical record. That was my first JAMA article, just looking at how advanced directives never actually got where they wanted to go. So we said, aha, we have a problem. We need to fix, hence the Pinto analogy. And the first fix was to say, okay, perhaps rather than just having an advanced directive, let's appoint a surrogate who can then read the advanced directive and follow wishes. And we, the healthcare proxy was born and we don't have to go through the decades of research that demonstrated that that in itself was problematic, um, including the fact that most healthcare proxies never knew that they were um, designated as a surrogate. Which brings us to the next phase, which was advanced care planning, which was, well, if we can't actually predict exactly the situation, perhaps we can have a series of conversations about hypothetical or perhaps even possible treatment decisions in the future, so I can understand how those treatments should be made and what decisions you would like me to do. Um, that seemed like a reasonable fix as well, except for the fact that all of the empirical data that has come out looking at that process has found that it's ineffectual. And whereas there is an argument that could be, well, perhaps we need to look further in advance and perhaps it's having something good is happening despite the fact we're not seeing goal concordant care, which was the objective of advanced care planning, perhaps it's still good. And my argument to that is perhaps. Yet we have more literature and empirical evidence around advanced directives and advanced care planning than we have in almost any other area of palliative care. And we can't even seem to find a hint that the needle has budged. And this has consequences because every dollar, every hour that goes into advanced care planning research means that it doesn't go into something else that's important uh, because it is truly in some respects a zero-sum game. There's a fixed pot of NIH dollars. There's a fixed palliative care research workforce. There's a fixed communication research workforce. And my feeling, and I've come to this uh, a long period of time, and this is from somebody who spent the first decade of his career doing research in this area, is that it's just, it's just quite simply not fair to our patients and our families to continue to try and get this car to run when there are so many other important issues. And let's seriously close this off and think about what are other core communication areas of research that need to happen. That was great. And, you know, I, I'm wondering if we can go back to kind of, you, you said that the, the literature around this is, is largely negative. There's been some positive studies too out there, right? It, it, I, again, I'm, I am not an expert. Maybe Alex knows more, but you certainly are, Sean. It's kind of a mixed bag, potentially because of who gets studied, how early on they get studied, what the intervention is. You know, are we talking about pulses? Are we talking about advanced directives? Are we talking about things like just having advanced care planning discussions? Um, how would you summarize our current state of the literature? Yeah, it's a very good question, Eric. And I and I would I would I would summarize it in this way. The first is that a couple of years ago there was a systematic review of systematic reviews that really sort of targeted all of those, um, you know, many of the areas that you said. And when you really break it down in that regard, you know, there are, what was it, um, 80 systematic reviews, systematic reviews of advanced care planning. And as you said, yeah, there are a couple studies in there and everybody cites them. Um, but when you look at the well-done studies, 
And I point to the two that were done within the past two years, um, Susan Mitchell's work, Pragmatic Trial in Nursing Homes, and the recent um, Australian study in cancer patients. There's nothing there. It's so interesting to me because there was always an explanation. For the Mitchell study, it was because, well, you know what? The intervention worked, but the nursing homes just didn't adapt it correctly. Well, hello, if they're not going to adapt it, how can the intervention work? I found a great article, um, and this is relevant, that talked about the strong evidence base for advanced care planning and cited a paper that Alex wrote. And I went <laughs> back to look at the paper that Alex wrote um, on, because I thought, geez, did I miss something? Um, you know, Alex is a brilliant uh, researcher, and if Alex yeah. says that's that's Alex remembers what he wrote. <laughs> um, and what it was, was it was a study with Rebecca Sudori around prepare that was about acceptability. I would not, I think it was about acceptability. Am I right, Alex? Uh, I don't you know. know. <laughs> um, <laughs> wrote a lot of things I, with Rebecca. <laughs> that was cited as, you know, strong, <laughs> a strong evidence base. And, you know, Alex, you're absolutely brilliant. I get it. Um, but your personal opinion, I'm not sure, is strong evidence base. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's the challenge, Eric, is that when you re- look through the, you know, over 1,500 studies, there are a few that pop out that everybody says, aha, mm-hmm. uh, see they work. And yet when you look at the really well done studies that have defined outcomes, that don't have contamination and our RCTs, for example, there's nothing there. You know, they're just, you have to find work really, really hard to find a positive result. And my feeling is that if you have to look that hard, is this something we should really be continuing to invest in? Um, and is this something we should be really focusing on given all the other needs we have? Yeah, I guess one question is, what does the alternative world look like? Well, you mean, do we go back to the 1970s where the only option is the default option where everybody gets everything that we can to prolong someone's life because nobody has done any advanced thinking about code status or intubation or, man, I have advanced cancer. Do I want all of these you know, default medicine treatments? Is, is that what we, we should be looking as as far as the alternative? Oh, you're going back to my Pinto era, or my dad's Pinto, which was, you know, the alternative was something a lot more expensive or new or different. It might have mean at that time, you know, buying a Honda. It was easier to try and fix the Pinto. Um, but no, in, in all seriousness, I think what it means is, and in some ways, this is why I chose the title of the editorial as it was, was communication is really hard sitting down with somebody with serious illness or their family members and understanding their values and goals and helping them guiding through complex decisions and outlining what are the likely outcomes, what's the prognosis, for example, what do we do if things don't go the way we want them to go? That's tough. That's really, and that's what, that's the gap that advanced care planning is trying to fill. And I think what we need to start to articulate is that that is really tough. That that's knowledge and skill that isn't something that can be trained up very, very quickly. It's not something that anybody can sit down and talk about. And in many respects, it's not something that we can predict. So what's the alternative? I think the alternative is what, in many respects, you folks have been working out at UCSF at, um, what Darren Highland in Canada has been working is, how do we help patients who have capacity, and how do we help families make better decisions when the decisions need to be made? And I don't know the answer or how that happens. I do know that that's an empiric question. And I think that one of the things that we do need to do is move away from the fact that says, okay, we should be doing this in advance. Um, We should be doing this well before this becomes real. We should prepare way ahead of the time, time because what we have to research is that that doesn't work. So maybe we should be focused on what do, for example, we'll take people without decisional capacity because that's the advanced care planning, advanced directive population. What do surrogates need to know right now 
to help them make a decision? What's the information that will help guide them? What do they need to know about their family member? You know, this idea of substituted judgment. How many times have we heard, I know what my dad would want and I'm not going to do that, right? And so I think we need a different paradigm for how we begin to make real-time decisions for people with serious illness, whether that be about treatment choices moving forward, whether that be crisis decisions. For example, in COVID, do I intubate somebody or not? You know, what we found during COVID, and again, I, I say this as anecdotal experience only, so many times when we had a goals of care discussion with somebody who had done a medical order for life-sustaining treatment, and we say, you know, for example, your prior wishes were X. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. Now that you've explained it to me, I want Y. And similar with family members. I think that we need a better way of having those conversations in real time. And again, do I know what that looks like? I don't. But I think that that's an empirical question we can answer. And that may be where we should be focusing some of our communication research rather than trying to do all this in advance. Advance is for us. Advance means that it's easier for us to make decisions in a crisis. That we have a roadmap, we have a plan, we know what to do, and therefore we don't have to make any decisions. I'm not sure what patients and families want. Do you feel like the advance is only for us and not for patients? Family members who may be called upon one day, sort of unwittingly? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting question and one that a lot of people have um, asked, right? Which is, does having something in advance take the burden off a proxy maker? And I suspect it does in some circumstances. And I suspect in some circumstances might make the decision easier. That being said, I would be really interested in the study that compares that to a healthcare professional who sits down and has a very good goals of care in the moment discussion and guides somebody through a decision that couldn't be predicted in advance and what the outcomes on that family are. My guess, quite honestly, is that, yeah, the advanced directive may have made the decision making a little easier, but I suspect that if you compared that to what is a very good in the moment goals of care discussion, um, the impact would be a lot more favorable to that family member. And I get it, Anne. I think, you know, there perhaps are some circumstances when that happens, but they're not the majority. And certainly the data that we have, when you look at, you know, thousands of patients, there's not a big impact on family member outcome because that advanced directive was present. Obviously, it does impact some. But if we're thinking about this as a population and we're going to spend money as a population, you know, we should be getting the majority, not the exception. And we do remember the exception. My head is trying to grapple with this because there's so many different aspects that I think I both agree with you and disagree with you at the exact same time. So I'm not sure. Like this is, you know, it's, it's a big shift. And I think, you know, if we can just potentially break it down, like, you know, I feel like one important aspect of advanced directive is assigning somebody as your, your surrogate, your, your proxy in the future, somebody that you trust. And while I think for a lot of individuals, it may not matter, but there's certain vulnerable populations where they have particular people that, that don't default in that hierarchy. They may be non, non-illegally married. They may not be able to marry it in their state, where that part of the advanced directive may become very important, assigning somebody as your healthcare agent. And I would not disagree with you, Eric, yeah. but I would say, you know, healthcare proxy, surrogate, decision maker... Been there, done that. You know, we know that that's a good thing. We yeah. don't need any more research. We don't need many things to say. You know, we have a power of attorney, financial power of attorney. We know that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. We don't need to research it. All right. So it's it's not that we shouldn't do them. It's we don't have to continually research whether or not that. And, right. And I think, you know, the things that we know are helpful Yeah. Um, are helpful. You know, for, as you said, for certain vulnerable populations, designating a healthcare proxy or a durable power of attorney for healthcare is a good thing. For some populations who, or some families, not populations, for some families who make decisions collectively as a family, can actually be a really bad thing because it elevates one person above everybody else. 
And yes, you can say, well, my healthcare proxy names my entire family to make collective decisions. So yeah, there's, I, I get that. Yeah, it's, it's important. Um, but for some, it may not be. Yeah. Now, I'm just also thinking back to when we were doing tele uh, palliative care consults to New York. Um, a lot of times that there was no advanced directive or proxy, which, like you said, that's something that we should keep in mind of that we were bringing together as much of the family as we could to have these really difficult conversations when we sometimes they've, they've never had these discussions. Sometimes they were very explicit and they did. Like, Oh yeah, she would want everything that you can to keep her alive, no matter what. And then we're trying to negotiate with a lot of different family members. My second question is moving from the advanced directive to advanced care planning or advanced care planning. When I'm having these discussions with family members and I have like granted like a palette of care note, somebody who is explicitly trained on how to have these discussions and they talk about values, goals, like what's important to them. Man, that certainly feels helpful in the time when we're actually ha- talking to the surrogate with that incapacitated patient like in the ICU or about to go to the ICU. And Eric, I wouldn't disagree with you, but you're having that conversation right then. You're not having that conversation five years ago yeah. when that ICU situation was hypothetical. But I am having a conversation with that patient, let's say, or the team had had a conversation six months ago with a patient who now has incapacity, but had capacity back then. And they, they've actually talked about, in a nice, I'm just thinking back to our, like our outpatient palliative care team when they're having these discussions, beautifully written about kind of what they value in their life, what's important to them, may not specifically talk about the exact interventions that they would or wouldn't want, yeah. like... ECMO or pressors and all of this, but it serves as a guide for us. And the quotes that they have in their notes certainly actually helps kind of us frame this to family members. And again, this is all, I don't have any exact evidence behind it, but it feels like that often moves us forward a lot more than having absolutely nothing. Yeah. And I think this is the challenge, Eric, because I, I can't argue with you or disagree with you, and I wouldn't. Um, you're, you know, you can. You're, like, yeah, you're a lot smarter than I am. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna. I gotta take. I'm not gonna take that one out. No way. Um, but let me push back a little bit. And again, stepping back, not so much from an individual situation, but taking it from a public health or a population standpoint. Um, and some of this, I think, is semantics. Um, you know, how far in advance does advance? Go? Yeah. You know, when your palliative care team is having that conversation with that particular patient. Obviously, something pretty bad is happening, or they wouldn't be seeing the palliative care team. Yeah. You know, so it's real. Yeah. Uh, My lovely wife may kill me for saying this, but, you know, when you're having that conversation, death has moved from the hypothetical to the possible to probably the probable. Yeah. Even though palliative care is not about end of life care. Um, So I would say that, you know, that's real. I would also say to you that, your palliative care team or your palliative care member is very different and trained very differently than an advanced care planning counselor, a general internist, an oncologist, because the information that you describe in that note was not gotten through a couple of key words, wasn't gotten through a checklist, it was gotten because that healthcare professional had sophisticated knowledge about that person's likely path forward, knew what specific questions to ask, and as importantly, what were the follow-up questions based on that answer. And they do this every single day, day yeah. in and day out. And I think that is very different than what we talk about as a public health advanced care planning, which is a relatively non-sophisticated approach to decision-making in people who range from the worried well to the actively dying. Yeah. And if you were to tell me that my intervention was going to do sophisticated communication skills training with every healthcare worker so that they have these discussions, I'm behind you on that one. Um, I'm behind, but that's not what I'm, that's not what the ACP literature is. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Because when I think about, so 
in the within the VA system, we have these life sustaining treatment notes. And Anne, you can back me up or disagree, but certainly feels like the vast majority of them they don't have the information that I want, which is the discussion part. It's mainly about the outcome and what they chose part, which is the issue with advanced directives is, man, I I feel like oftentimes it's it's not helpful because it's so focused on the outcome rather than the process. And Eric, again, I'm older than you were. In fact, I remember Eric when he was a resident here. Um, (laughs) But those, that same point, was being made back in 1995 when I first published on advanced directives. And 30 years later, after all of that research, we're still making that point. And that's we still haven't moved forward. That's because we haven't had podcasts back then. Uh, clearly. That's right. Clearly. Not, not enough dissemination. And it looks like you were going to jump in here. Well, no, I was just thinking about, you know, certainly I, I am not older than Eric, and I haven't been doing this as many years. And and at the same time, yes, the, the notes and the substantive conversations that are documented through like a palliative care physician are incredibly useful. And I would say that that doesn't mean that the primary palliative care interventions that primary care physicians and social workers and others use aren't also useful in those crunch time situations when we're having those family meetings in the ICU when someone is incapacitated and their family members are trying to gather all the data they can because being in the position to try to make a decision for someone else, I know I'm preaching the choir, is profoundly distressing. And if there's any data out there to help make that process feel informed, people usually want it, you know, I think anecdotally. And so I guess I'm wondering, okay, maybe it's not always as documented or conducted in this really expertly trained way, but does that mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater, that all those conversations aren't useful? Oh, it's so interesting because I'm responding to the letters to the editor and somebody just made that, I got a late letter and somebody made, just made that point. Um, so let me respond to that in a couple of ways. I think what is so difficult about advanced care planning is that fundamentally, we believe it should work. That at a fundamental level, we have such faith in it that it needs to work. And what you said, Anne, that we can all remember distinctly situations where it was helpful. And yet, and this is the big issue, and yet, when we actually look at good research, that not just looks at you know, the situations where we found that it, we think it's a good thing. But when we actually look, and, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of it. It's not like it's one or two studies. There's a lot. There is nothing in that that says that it's beneficial for the majority of people, or even, and I use the S word, really, a significant minority. And so that comes up against this fundamental belief that we have that says, Well, I can't be wrong because this is, it makes so much sense. This makes so much sense. It just has to be right. And yet, every time we do, we study it, we can't make that. And so what happens and what's really, I, and again, this is the last time I talk about my age, but what I really find interesting (laughs) is that each new generation of researchers wants to do advanced care planning research right off the bat because it makes so much sense and they just we could just do the right study we'll be able to demonstrate it that it works and i've now seen this happen one two three four times and in fact i have a medical student this week who wants to meet with me to do acp research because he knows how to make it work and so i come back to you and say yes and the same thing i said to eric yeah there are going to be individual times and certain circumstances where this does work. And yet, for the majority of people in the majority of situations, it doesn't. And if this were something we were spending a little bit of time, a little bit of money, a little bit of advertising on, sure, but we're not. We're spending still a lot of money. I can't remember what I came up with in my article, but tens of millions of dollars, I have to look. Um, we spent funding this stuff. Mm-hmm. 
More than 300 million, about a million a year. Yeah, about a million a year. Think yeah. what we could have done to the patients that you care for with that type of money. Think how much money has gone into programs like Respecting Choices over the years. And if we had put that money into, for example, a public relations campaign around, campaign around palliative care so that every seriously ill person in their family knew what palliative care was. I mean, these are real choices we're making. Mm. These are real choices. I just wanted to say that I love these articles that challenge accepted geriatrics, palliative care, bioethics dogma. And advanced care planning is certainly a central tenet, central component of all of those fields. And your article reminds me of, and it seems like it's a successor to a series of articles that have lamented the state of advanced care planning and, um, you know, the focus put on advanced directives. I'm remembering in particular an article that Susan Block um, shared with me back in 2005. It was titled Enough, Failure of the Living Will by Angie Figerlin and Carl Schneider, um, you know, bioethicists. Um, And I'll just quote from that. In social policy, as in medicine, plausible notions can turn out to be bad ideas. Bad ideas should be renounced. Bloodletting once seemed plausible, but when it demonstrably failed, the course of wisdom was to abandon it, not to insist on its virtues and to scrounge for alternative justifications for it. Living wills were praised and peddled before they were fully developed, much less studied. They have now failed repeated tests of practice. It is time to say enough. And in this article, they were um, railing against the living wills in particular um, and the Patient Self-Determination Act, which as a matter of policy mandates that all hospitals must um, ask patients if they have completed an advanced directive um, or provide them with advanced directive material so they can complete it themselves. Huge amount of policy effort gone into all hospitals doing this um, for years, right? This article came out in 2004. Um, So it's not just research, it's also the policy and the practice of it. So I guess my question for you is, um, as a matter of research, I hear you, you feel like this is not an area that we should prioritize. We need to prioritize other things that are more urgent. We've done enough in this area. As a matter of policy, what do you think we should be doing as a nation regarding advanced care planning, you know, including advanced directives, healthcare proxies, uh, and uh, efforts to fund, say, communication around plans and preferences for end-of-life care as funded by Medicare in the annual wellness visit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So three answers to that question, Alex. Um, you know, two very straightforward and one longer. The first straightforward is, you know, everybody who wants to should have a healthcare proxy. I have a healthcare proxy. My instructions are do whatever is going to make your life better. That's it. Um, you know, straightforward. Number two, you know, every state should have a family decision act so that, you know, when we need to make decisions for somebody with that capacity, there is somebody who can step up and do it. The third answer, though, is more complicated. And I think this is, this is where I think advanced care planning has such, why people are so enthralled with it, because the alternative is so difficult. Because if the holy grail is goal concordant care, which is the purpose in many respects of advanced care planning, right? If, if the holy grail is goal concordant care, that will never happen, ever happen, until we fix the finances of the health system. Until the profit motive changes, until at 3 a.m. in the morning, somebody's on the other end of the phone when the patient's wife calls and says, my husband can't breathe, and can say, okay, this is what we need to do, and this is what we're going to do, rather than call 911. He wouldn't want to go to the hospital. I don't have anything else to offer. He needs to go to the emergency department. Until we can fix that, we're never going to get to goal concordant care. And advanced care planning is the band-aid that continuously falls off because we actually can't stitch up the wound that is our healthcare system. And that's hard. And I think that's why we're really frightened about doing it. Communication training is hard. You know, we'd like to be able to say, check these boxes off and you can do it, but it's hard. And I think that the attraction about advanced care planning is the possibility that we could make it work and we don't have to tackle 
what are the fundamental problems in ensuring equitable access and goal concordant care in this country. So where would I focus? I would not focus on advanced care planning. I'd focus on those issues. Yeah, so the, the, the real Pinto is actually our U.S. healthcare system, and uh, the, <laughs> the carburetor that keeps on breaking down is the advanced care planning component. Um, That's brilliant. That is you, can, awesome. you, can, you can try to There's redesign a new carburetor for that Pinto, yeah. but uh, it's true. still a Pinto. Yeah, I, and that is absolutely brilliant. Okay, these are my last question. What do you say to critics who may say, okay, we're going to go back before any of us were born to the Flexner report, which was like, I don't know, 1910, something like that, right? Which was a report that really was a, um, a, a massive critique of uh, any kind of medicine that was not allopathic medicine, right? And really what it represented was a um, circling of the wagons around a profession and a profession protecting itself, right? So is there some sense in which your argument could be viewed as we shouldn't be investing in advanced care planning, we should be investing in the profession of palliative medicine, and that only we have the tools and skills to address this complex communication, and only when we are funded by the health system uh, will we be um, able to achieve our goals of goal concordant care? God, I hope that's not what I'm saying. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, we will never have a palliative care workforce, you know, to take care of everybody, and we shouldn't. Um, However, what I would argue back to you, Alex, and coming back to the Flexner Report, is everything in our current healthcare system, our structures, our payment systems, our specialist-driven care, was Medicare, is all developed to meet the needs of a population that no longer exists. When all of this infrastructure was created, people developed a serious illness and they died. It's fascinating when you look at time from diagnosis to death, cancer, COPD, heart disease, stroke, it stays virtually unchanged from the 40s and 50s all the way through into the early 90s. That, that time for diagnosis to death really doesn't budge. And so we've built up this entire healthcare system that can't meet the needs of a population that is now living with multiple chronic conditions, serious illness, and there's a tremendous mismatch. And it's not just a physician mismatch. It's, a, it's the difference between medical care and healthcare. We've got a healthcare mismatch. And what I would argue is we need a new Flexner report, which is not driven at protecting the specialty, but much more driven at what does the population of people living with serious illness who we as palliative care clinicians care for, we as geriatricians care for, we as primary care docs care for, and what is the system that's going to support that care that we provide because our population is different and the diseases we see are different. And the interactions of those diseases are different. The same way that the diseases we saw before public health and infection control came into practice. We made that adjustment. I think now is the time that we need to make a similar adjustment so that our healthcare system is a better match for the population that's caring for. It was a great match for the population in the 1960s. It was a pretty good match in the 50s. It was not so bad in the 70s. It's pretty lousy now. I got one question. I'm guessing you're going to have some author letters to you on this article from the the, the Pulsed folks. Because isn't there some data around Pulsed and goal concurrent care? Um, and I think, you know, I'm just thinking about like advanced care planning, how advanced, like in that population for Pulsed, it should be people with a very serious illness, generally limited life expectancy, that, that they're dealing with their current situation and they're thinking about kind of what are their goals and what, kind of what treatments would they want versus somebody like me. I actually don't have an advanced directive because the default is my wife. We've talked about it. And I actually don't see a need for me to do advanced directive. But if I got, I mean, in that situation, I'm dealing with a serious illness. I, I, I fill out a pulse. Is that also part of this? How are you thinking about it? Little data? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And I think the challenge with Pulse and, I, and the studies that are starting to come out around this is that 
Pulse is filled out by physicians or other healthcare professionals who can issue medical orders, medical orders for life-sustaining treatment. And it's a way of getting around the hard conversation. And so, yes, there are some studies that show that there's goal concordant care, but not strong data. And there are equally studies that would scare me more is people who have a pulse who have no idea that they filled it out, have no idea what's on it, or would disagree with what's on it. And I think the challenge with Pulst or Molst or Emolst is we have absolutely no understanding of the quality of the conversation that went into it. We have really good data, um, some from you guys, that demonstrates that we know these conversations are not ideally what we would want to be from the average professional. And now these are medical orders, not just a suggestion. And for a medical order that says, I don't want to be in the ICU or I don't want to be on a ventilator in the midst of a COVID epidemic where I am potentially facing a shortage of ICU beds and a shortage of ventilators and somebody who needs me in the next bed, you don't think I'm going to just take that and run with it? I think these are, I'm still trying to grapple <laughs> with this. I love, like Ali said, just kind of the, the devil's advocate position here, thinking about kind of, you know, does this work? Where should our resources be put out? I, I think part of, you know, how I also think about it is, man, we all know our system's pretty screwed up. If there was an easy fix for that, probably would have figured out how to do it. I also don't see a fix for the Pinto. So we're, we're, we're stuck with all these band-aids like advanced care planning and advanced directives, recognizing that we're not going to get a new Pinto for a while, which is our healthcare system. See, but I would disagree with that, Eric, because I think our responsibility is to really push for that, for that new system. And it may be small steps that we're not helping our patients and our families by continuing something that we know really doesn't work and doesn't work for most of them. Um, and so let's tackle the big problem. Somebody said to me back when I first got my PDIA Soros Award, you know, palliative care is never going to take off. You know, it's too big a problem. Well, worked pretty well, you know, and it disseminated. I, I don't think the problem is too big to fix. We have to fix it. If we don't fix it, you know, by the time the baby boomers hit Medicare, we're in big, big. So we've got to fix it. I don't think it's too, too hard to fix. We just yeah. have to focus. Yeah, we'll get fooled again. We will. Ah, you like that, Alex? I'm f foreshadowing to your song right now. <laughs> there's, there's always some attempted pun. I haven't the been here in a while, but I see some things haven't changed. Some things haven't changed. Well, no, as a regular watcher, I can tell you they don't. Yeah. <laughs> and the, this, uh, you know, the lyrics to this song are just prescient, you know. Um, there's nothing in the streets looks any different to me. The slogans are replaced by the by and the parting in the left and now the par are now the parting on the right. And the beards have all grown longer overnight. I'll tip my hat to the new constitution. Take a bow for the new revolution. Smile and grin at the change all around. Take up my guitar and play just like yesterday. We won't get fooled again. <laughs> yeah. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. It is always a pleasure to talk to you guys. You were very gentle with me, and I really appreciate it. And it was really a pleasure to meet you. Here. Nice to meet you, Sean. Take and up the guitar, Alex. That's all here. right. We'll pick up the guitar and play. Here we go. There's nothing in the streets looks any different to me, and the slogans are replaced by the fire. Yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> 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 I had to throw in a little Pete Townsend. <laughs> Sean, a very big thank you for joining us. Really oh, appreciate it. And always a pleasure to have you on too. To all of our listeners, thank you for supporting the Jerry Powell Podcast. I just looked at our, our stats and We've had a half a million plays um, since Whoa. our inception. <laughs> a half of those were in the last year. So a uh, big thank you to everybody. If you, if you take a second, please continue to support us by rating us on your favorite podcasting app or tweeting us out there, one of your favorite episodes. So again, thank you to everybody. And a big thank you to Archstone Foundation for your continued support. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Eh? Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.